Hello everyone and welcome back to another Andy Devo guide video for Blood Bowl 3. Today in the spotlight we've got Nurgle. This video is going to talk about the players in initially and then how to level them up. After that we'll go into some rosters, so you've got the core uh, rosters built for you. Then I'm going to talk about general gameplay strategy in terms of how to make Nurgle uh, work both defensively and offensively. I'll link in some uh, setups for you as well. And then finally, we'll close the video out with some inducement advice and what is the, what's best to take and what's not. With respect to Nurgle overall, we've actually be, seen a lot of change from Blood Bowl 2. Not only have the players changed, uh, but some of the stat lines have changed as well. So if you are coming in from Blood Bowl 2, uh, pair that in mind. Also, I think that you need to consider that Nurgle are one of the weaker teams in the roster of 12 that we've been given initially in the Blood Bowl 3 launch. And they have also fundamentally changed from what was at a high team value, a very combat orientated murder machine. You've now got to play them as a control team uh, with a little bit of combat ability as well. Finally, we close out that the Nurgle team are also very expensive. So you're not going to get your full complement of players at uh, TV1000. One of the reasons they are so weak. Uh, and the other is they've got no ball playing uh, ability whatsoever. Only the Pestigors, of which you're only allowed four, can actually do anything remotely competent with the ball and everyone else is just playing bad. So with that in mind, let's go and have a look at the roster and see what is actually out there. Right, so I said in the introduction that the Nurgle team is quite expensive uh, and now looking at the actual roster positionals of which we have four, you can start to see why. We're able to take up to one Rotspawn, we can take up to four Bloaters, up to four Pestigors and then an unlimited amount of Rossa linemen. Uh, you'll see here that these two are, these positionals are very expensive. This is on the high side and then this is incredibly cheap. So uh, let's dive in and look at the first one. The Rotspawn is the old Beast of Nurgle name. In fact, it says Beast of Nurgle there, and it's movement 4, it's strength 5, which is great, standard skill, a strength for a big guy. It's armor 10+, plus, which again is pretty standard. However, what it, why do we take this guy? We take it because it's got tentacles, and tentacles allows you to keep players in position and stop them moving away. It's a strength variant skill, so the higher your strength versus your opponent, the more likely it is to work. So think of it as a, a good way of holding down halflings or uh, maybe elves or, or uh, elf linemen, human linemen, that sort of thing. But it won't work very well uh, against your higher strength problems like uh, biggins or chaos warriors. We've got the mighty blow skill as a standard on a big guy. And unfortunately, we've got the really stupid skill, which is one of the worst uh, nega traits on uh, the big guys. So we do need to keep a friend with it at all times to make it work. Because otherwise, without a friend, we've got a, uh, a four plus role to make it behave itself. From a leveling up perspective, again, as with all big guys, we want to jump into the, uh, the strength skill tree and we want to take guard immediately. And then after that, I really like stand firm because then when you put your tentacles into contact with someone, then you actually don't get pushed away uh, and your stand firm holds them in place. Other skills that are worth a note, I don't think you should be blitzing, so let's not talk about Juggernaut. Uh, grab is interesting and does keep the player in contact if you are blocking and then... The, the other skill I think you really desperately should be looking at here is block because people will throw two dice uphill or two red dice at you. So consider the block skill so that you are again stood in place and you are not getting kicked out. It also makes it slightly more reliable if you are throwing blocks with this player. As a fourth skill, it, it was a, a genuine toss up whether I was going to recommend uh, defensive or whether I was going to recommend pro. I'm going to recommend pro here because if you want to be moving your Beast of Nurgle around and you've got to the point where you're using it and got four skills on it, chances are the way you're playing it is a very proactive uh, mobile player. So therefore, pro would probably make sense in that uh, skill slot. That's not to say that defensive is a bad idea. It's just that I think probably pro would suit you the way you're playing that player slightly better uh, than defensive. From a randoming point of view, I would strongly recommend you avoid randoming all levels, even perhaps past the, the first level trying to fish for guard because... This player really shouldn't be picking up many star player points throughout its period of life and therefore just try and take the skills as you get them, uh, starting with guard and then stand firm. Characteristic wise, while strength is absolutely amazing for this player because it enhances the already strong tentacles options, the rest of the skills on it, uh, the rest of these are all absolute trash garbage. So the only way I would save up for a characteristic was when we got to the point where you're saving up for either block or pro and then you just start fishing and seeing whether or not you're going to get uh, the golden strength. If you get it, great. If not, you just take the double skill anyway, which is either block or pro uh, or defensive. And, and then you just save up and rinse and repeat. Right, moving on to the, the bloaters or the Nurgle warriors as they are. Nurgle warriors are movement four, strength four, which is great. Uh, unfortunately, they're four plus, so you're not dodging with them particularly. They can just about pass, but they are absolutely abysmal at it. But they are armor 10 plus. They do have 
Uh, an interesting additional skill, which we didn't talk about on the Beast of Nurgle, which is Foul Appearance, which means that if someone wants to punch them in the face, then they have to throw a d6 and not roll a 1. So the idea behind the Nurgle Warriors and the Beast of Nurgle is that the Foul Appearance starts to protect them a little bit, and then they can also interact and mess around with the opponent's throwing game, passing game, or even just handing off game. The Disturbing Presence, it does stack. So if you have two players stood next to each other, it's minus one per player that has this within a three square grid. This is why they're starting to consider a control team because you've got five players that have actual general access to this, both Disturbing Presence and Foul Appearance, and you can just stop people from doing things. And, and as such, I think one of the better ways now to build this player and lean into that sort of idea of, of shutting down passing and stopping people doing anything is that I would go general tree, take block, because they're incredibly unreliable. Then I go general tree, and I take two with mighty blow and two with guard. Once they get to those second skills and they're ready for the third skill, just take the one that you didn't take out of mighty blow and guard. And then I really like the idea of stand firm. And if you want to, you can jump into claws. But because claws and mighty blow don't stack now properly, uh, unless you're going to be playing a predominant AV10 plus uh, division, then I would stay away from four claws which was the old meta, and I would start moving towards things like uh, stand firm on all four of them, and then also uh, defensive is a good skill on a couple of them because it just shuts down the opposition's guard, and it just means they just, again, can't do anything. You're playing that control style now rather than that murder-kill-death style. From a randoming point of view, I don't see there's much value in randoming other than potentially taking uh, a strength skill at the start because I wouldn't be upset with Guard or Mighty Blow as primaries. Stand Firm is also pretty tasty. And then in here, Grab's not bad. Unfortunately, Juggernaut sucks. So does Break Tackle. Pretty much so does Brawler and so does Armbar. So the, there are a bunch of skills that you don't want. And if you're randoming, then you are slowing down the development of an already slow player because you know, we're movement four and we're edge four plus, scoring touchdowns is going to be slow. You haven't got block. You haven't even got mighty blow. You're not going to be causing casualties off the gate, out the gate. So I would avoid randoming, even in the strength tree uh, I, uh, to begin with. Next, we've got the Pestigors. Again, I just uh, comment, we've got, we can have up to four of these. You will want to run all four of these, absolutely certainly. It is annoying they cost 75k each because they are expensive and you've already just picked five players that are already very expensive. Uh, but unfortunately, they're the only players on the team with average ball handling. Everybody else is worse than average. So you've got to take all four because you're going to need them. Um, you've also got different career trees that you need to go down with the Pestigors because there are three primary different uh, roles that need fulfilling and the Pestigor needs to fill all three of them. Uh, the first one is the obvious one, which is the ball carrier. So from a level up perspective, we need to take uh, we need to take block. We need to take sure hands. And then the mutation tree, I really like uh, the idea that we take two heads and we take uh, extra arms. Those skills are very strong. You can also look at a monstrous mouth because it gives you a free catch skill, but that's more for handing off rather than your primary ball carrier. Then we need to build uh, not one, but two players that can actually enforce, uh, and so killers effectively. And those players, I think you need to go block, tackle, mighty blow, and frenzy, sorry, from that skill tree. And then we also need uh, claws. They have five skills. In what order you take them, I think the two players should level up slightly differently. So... First player, you need to be able to deal with agility type players. So I'd go block, then tackle, then mighty blow, then probably frenzy, then claw. And on the other side, I would then say, right, we need to deal with high armored targets. Then we need a sort of can opener type player. So I would go block, mighty blow, claw, frenzy, tackle, because the high armor stuff doesn't tend to have dodge. So you've end up with the same place. You've just got there two completely different routes. And then your final skill player uh, is the fourth Pestigore, and that is your utility player. And I think that's where you could stick Monstrous Mouth because you've got a catch then. Uh, you absolutely at that point need to take extra arms. And I like the idea that you then take block and guard and possibly two heads as the other skills. Uh, so although it's loaded with mutations, it's a player that can actually support the play because it's got block guard. But it can also receive a handoff if you start getting yourself into a tight situation because you haven't been able to make a lot of forward progress. That's how I would probably build the utility player. I have seen people build them with a passing thought in mind, but notice that both agility and passing are secondary skills, so they're costing 40 team value each, and they're costing 40 team value on top of the already quite expensive price that you're paying for a 75k player, and so suddenly Nogal go from being expensive to being absolutely outrageous. So I would avoid coming into this skill tree for anything other than potentially leader, um, and I don't think there's a, there's a player slot 
a skill slot available for even leader, even on the ball carrier. Final player we've got to talk about is the Rotter lineman. Think of these players basically as cannon fodder. Uh, they are terrible. They also won't live for very long. So the reason they won't live for very long uh, is because we've got decay, although it has changed and is now saying that the plus one on test made on the casualties table played against this player. That's an improvement over rolling two separate casualties. Decay is still not a very good skill and it means the chance of getting a badly hurt is now only one in six in 16 rather than seven in 16. Someone in the comment section, by all means, correct me. Uh, I can't quote the casualty table uh, off the top of my head at the moment. But anyway, they're, they're not great and they don't have regen and you don't have any way of fixing them when they die. So that, that's actually one of the major reasons they will die is that there is no way once they caught, get receive a serious injury, there is no way of fixing them uh, as standard unless you want to take a plague doctor, which is a terrible inducement. So as such, don't think about them having long-term careers. They're only movement five anyway. Strength three, which is fine. Agi four plus, which is terrible. So picking the ball up on a four plus just on the floor is, is really bad now. That's a decrease from Agi three as they were in Blood Bowl two. They can barely pass the ball. So you're not going to get any vanity passing on them. And they're AV nine plus. Really, I think we just need to think of them as cannon fodder. And at that point, um, I would take them as wrestle at a higher team value, block as their primary skill at low team value, and then... I would absolutely look to try and get one of them into dirty player uh, as quickly as possible as a primary skill. Stay away from secondary skills. They're expensive. You, know, you don't want to add, add value onto them. Uh, and I don't think there's anything in the mutation tree that adds any value whatsoever. So really it's just block and wrestle on most of them. Dirty player on one, possibly two. So you can foul uh, and we can combine that up with some inducements um, from uh, the inducements part of the video uh, to try and give yourself a little bit of extra firepower. Uh, but broadly, you'll be feeling no more than two or three of these on a drive, and they are just there to just stop your important players actually getting killed. Right, it's roster time. So again, as usual, we've got three normal rosters for you. The first one is the one I'm going to recommend to you, and this is the Nurgle Balanced roster. Because Nurgle are so expensive, you absolutely have to give away and give up compromises all over the place. I've taken four bloaters here. These are the core players on the team, I think, uh, along with the Pestigors. So I've tried to get as many of those in. Uh, but because we've got no actual useful starting skills, I've given us three team re-rolls uh, and two ball carriers. And they will, one of them will get injured or one of them will get knocked over or whatever. And then you've got someone else that can do something. So you've got six good players and then five terrible players, which over the first couple of games, you will then buy, I would say, uh, extra Pestigors. And I would go uh, third Pestigore, Beast of Nurgle, fourth Pestigore. And that's fine because these players will die. So you'll actually probably end up staying at around the 11 player mark uh, because as the Rotters die, you don't care. You just replace them with proper players. The downside uh, is we've got dedicated fans of only one. So you're not going to be generating lots of money. And also where a lot of the roster guides have been giving you sort of, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, or even a full roster of good players. Nurgle are only giving you six good players and a load of absolute garbage. So this is another reason why Nurgle are one of the, uh, the lower uh, ability teams on the the first initial 12-man roster that Blood Bowl 3 released. Next, I'm going to move into a different balanced roster, and this gives you slightly more in terms of good players. So we had six in the previous roster. We've gone to seven here, but unfortunately, it's come at the cost of a team reroll. Now, we've actually managed to bend an extra uh, dedicated fan in there, so that's really helpful, but we are only making 5k a game more, and the rerolls are super expensive. So uh, if we go into recruitment, uh, we'll see that the reroll is going to cost us 140k once we've bought off, yeah, once we've actually started. So that making that extra 5k a game, it, when you need to make a dent of 140, it really isn't going to make a, a lot of difference. However, the the team will feel more responsive on the field because we've got three pestigors. So if you are someone that might struggle initially uh, to get going and you think you're going to make mistakes, this roster potentially might do a bit more for you because you've now got three ball carriers, not two. The downside is you're going to have to be super reliant on um, on early re-rolls, and you do need to get that third re-roll. That would be the third, first thing I would pick up on this roster. We've gone three players, three bloaters, and a beast. If you want to generate a little bit of extra cash, you could replace the beast with a fourth bloater, and that would give you an extra two um, fans. It's not a terrible idea, in fact. So it's up to you what four of those five you're going to take. Uh, and then the idea is you're getting an extra pestigore, but it's costing you a re-roll. Early picks, pick up the re-roll. And then once you picked up the re-roll, go and pick up the fourth blo bloater. Uh, and then you're probably good to go. 
But in terms of how much money that is, that's 140 for the re-roll and another 115 on top for the bloater. You're looking at a cool 250 to get going and you're not going to be making much more than 30 or 40 in a game. So, you know, good luck with that. It'll take you a while. Next we've got is roster three. Uh, and the idea of roster three is just to give you all of the big toys. So I've given you all five uh, of the, uh, the strongest players so you can try and make a dominant dent on your opponent in terms of actually on the pitch metrics. It unfortunately comes at some several costs though. We've only got one ball carrier, literally one. If you have no margin for error whatsoever. So if this player gets knocked over or worse removed, you are in serious trouble. Um, I don't like this roster very much. I think it's incredibly unreliable and worse, it doesn't even have any margin for error down in the reroll department. If we were running with three rerolls, this roster might work because you're unlikely to be able to, yeah, you're going to roll a one in nine in terms of blocking, which is a school both down. You can reroll it because you've got three rerolls. With two rerolls, you're going to have to be super selective about what blocks you throw. And I just think this roster's um, it, it's just lacking quite a lot, to be honest. But it does come with all the toys, uh, or the top of the end of the toys anyway, and you've got a second dedicated fan. But yeah, for me, the roster I'm going to recommend uh, is roster one, uh, where you've got the three rerolls, which I think is critical, and you've got four bloaters. And you've got to accept that this is just like paying poor chaos. Um, it's it's chaos, but worse, really. However, what you've got is to look forward to somewhere down the line and you can say, do you know what? This won't be terrible and just give it six months and it'll be fine. Back to the Nurgle roster. However, I think once you've got the initial start blueprint of this team, you will be able to build on it. You'll be able to pick up the Beast of Nurgle. You'll be able to pick up the two Pestigors. And I think this roster is the one that you should be taking. Right, let's go and look at some setups. Right, let's look at strategy and tactics for Nurgle. Uh, I've started off, we're going to do the offensive site setup. And you'll notice that this setup contains a lot of players that are not actually on the line of scrimmage. And the reason for that is Nurgle are an incredibly slow team overall. And they are ex very easy to expose if your opponent gets around the back uh, or just manages to rush a ball carrier that's sat on his own. So what I've done here is we've taken the two most likely ball carrier candidates and I've just put them so that they can go and fetch a ball that goes deep. We've also got a third Pestigore that if you have got a third Pestigore, he's able to go and fetch a shallow kick. And I've only put four players on the line of scrimmage. I've covered it off with the remaining two bloaters just tugging on the outside of the uh, wide zones. And then we've got two linemen rotters here. So the idea is that all of those players just shamble towards the ball wherever it goes uh, on turn one. So you end up with an actual sort of fully formed cage uh, if the ball has gone shallow. Uh, you've got enough free players to just walk towards it. If it goes deep, then these players can then go and move in the general direction of where the ball has gone immediately. Think of the overall drive as an eight-turn concept. You're not trying to score in two, three, four turns. You absolutely are just planning out an eight-turn drive. And with that in mind, moving and caging up even halfway inside your own half is totally fine. Your biggest weakness is being turned over early. Moving on to the defensive setups. First of all, again, Thinking about the movement of the team that you've got, I've decided that the best way to pro approach this is to hold the centre and then from this point uh, on defence on turn one, then react to what your opponent is doing. You're not quick enough to be able to start going on the front foot immediately and proactively attacking on defence. But effectively, that's what you do on defence is you attack uh, the ball carrier. So... Let's play with a very uh, compact line. We'll protect the rotters in the middle. And then again, as I do with the orcs, we put the bloaters on the corner points and then the pestigores go here and here and here and here. If you've got that many. If you don't, then of course, you'll be replacing those early doors with uh, extra uh, rotters. But as you get a proper team, you'll be moving to this sort of shape. The idea, you, you lock up turn one and then you'll be able to move out and press accordingly uh, on turns two and three. If, however, you need to start stopping a score then you do need to spread out a lot. And this does come with some vulnerabilities because, of course, once they get past you, you'll be in trouble. However, uh, this setup is uh, is different to, say, an Orc setup or a Chaos setup uh, where you're trying to stop a score. And the reason for that is because these players have all got uh, this skill here, Foul Appearance, but more importantly, this one here, Disturbing Presence, which means that within three squares, a three-square grid, they impact the ability to receive and catch the ball. So... What we're looking at doing here, of course, is number four is impacting all of these squares around him, but also the three the three squares here 
uh, or the four squares there. Uh, number two is also impacting it two squares deep in, in a sort of a distinct fragrance around there. We've got the Beast of Nurgle in the middle, or the Rot Spawn, that's doing stuff here. And then on this side, these two are doing stuff over here. They've got overlapping fields of fire from the Disturbing Fragrance. So potentially your Elf or your Skaven is sat in, you know, not one, but two or even three um, Disturbing Fragrance areas. So receiving the ball, that means they need to start with their receiver further back. If they're starting with their receiver further back, there's less far it can get forward. See how that's ad ad having an advantage, putting the, uh, the strength players... Uh, further forward. However, I haven't pulled the fast players any further forward to support them. All your four pestigoids, if you've got them, are actually your furthest back players because if your opponent does try and run through your line, you've got the ability to go and attack them uh, with a strength four blitz from the pestigoids. So this is a bit more stretched out and the idea, of course, is trying to build around disturbing presence or as I call it, disturbing fragrance. Now to talk about overall strategy with Nurgle. So Nurgle, I, I've been unfairly joking with them and saying they're just rubbish chaos. That's not actually entirely, it's not unfair, but it's also um, not actually uh, very constructive. Nurgle, I think, are actually a very specialised chaos and they specialise in defence. They specialise in creating a problem and turning your opponent over. So what you should be looking to do is lean into that, which is why the skill building, I've been talking about block and guard and stand firm uh, as skills. You want to try and choke up your opponent, press into them, and then turn them over when they've run out of options or when they can't do stuff because they've failed a foul appearance roll. First things first, with Orcs, start off with a flat defense here. Uh, if the ball is somewhere over here, then you start taking this side away from them. And it's about controlling areas of the field that your opponent can go into, and you need to play the trash compactor defense. So... You know, these players all become a flat line. You then steal the right-hand side over here, and then the right-hand side players all just edge in and edge in and edge in until you just compact them and crush them and stop them from going anywhere. The Nurgle are very good at removing players once they get to a higher team value because Claw, Mighty Blow, and Block, it's still very viable. So you've got the ability to try and actually gain extra players. And once you gain extra players, you can start not just having a flat line, but you can keep a couple of Pestigors like I've got here. We'll just demonstrate a flat line defense where well, we just go and pick a couple of players up um, and you end up with a flat line defense that looks like this right we're stopping them getting past here um, we've got two safeties and we might actually have taken five and six and put them into the opponent's half so we're just starting to creep round and we're running cutting them out of options we want to keep our opponent as contained as possible uh, as a general strategy Next, against Elves, unfortunately, they're probably our hardest matchup because although we're very good at disrupting their passing play, uh, a smart Elf will just hold the ball on a Blodge player and then run through our line. So a Dark Elf Blitz is a, a real problem for us. It's Movement 7, it's got Block and Dodge, uh, almost certainly, and it'll just run through our lines. Uh, the way to deal with that player, again, is we need to have safeties um, and we want to space our safeties out and we need to go and get our Tentacle Beast and go and put them into as many players as possible. Um, the way to beat elves is unfortunately still very much the case of smash them into pieces uh, and, and, and cut down their options. The worst type of gameplay that you can get yourself into is a board state that's just scattered everywhere because you've got no control and they absolutely, no matter what team you're playing into, they will run rings around you. Let's have a quick look at offensive set, uh, strategy as well. So offensive strategy, again, we need to be playing a running game and ideally uh, numbers 10 and 9 here which you go screen pieces assuming that number seven has got the ball, really you're trying to avoid having to, to screen and you want to go as wide as possible uh, to give yourself as much option as possible in the early couple of turns. So you can attack down the middle with these players, you can attack down either flank with the, 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 the flanking players. If you've got additional pestigors, we, again, we want to try and keep them apart. So we've got a pestigor on here, a pestigor here, and a pestigor here. This gives you options, and ideally, all the Nurgle Warriors step forward as a group. They push into your opponent with a block and guard, and they force your opponent to go backwards. In the same way that the previous video, I talked about the Dwarven tank uh, on offense, I should also think that the Nurgle team need to play uh, very offensively. But I think that more so than the Dwarves, they need to consider stealing space almost from probably like turn two or even turn three as quickly as possible because they're so slow that uh, you do not want to get into any form of war with a team and not be able to move forwards. So try and make sure that you've taken your block and guard skills, you move forwards and you are uh, stealing space wherever possible. Ideally in the previous section, well, in the previous section we talked about leveling up players and you've got a dirty player. Make sure that you are leaning into that dirty player as much as possible. That's your damage engine and that's your ability to get ahead in, in player numbers. 
So do think about your turns in the first three, four turns from the point of view of how can I get a maximum fa foul on someone? Maybe run from the side, blitz them, push them into your players, knock them over, and then with a dirty player, stomp on them. And you can combine that with bringing the ball and putting the ball somewhere near the foul zone so that you've already got a clump of players, the ball is protected, and then you drop the foul, you get rid of someone. After that, the bloaters then become pieces just to hold the play up while the pestigors run through a gap and then form a cage and then the following turn they score. Turns two through five, two through six, you're looking to maybe get um, from, if this is the halfway line we're going south, we need to get to the ball to being about sort of here. Um, somewhere um, sort of here or here, just so we're actually in scoring range. And then what will happen is hopefully you'll take this pestigore and the other pestigores and you'll somehow, you'll form a, a screen and you'll just run through it and then the final pestigo will just screen you. So you like you end up like that, uh, with the with all other players being stuck here, and you've just run through the gap, and then you can score. It's not going to traditionally be uh, a slow march cave, cage all the way down, and so those pestigors that started off on the wings might just gravitate a little bit tighter, or you will only run through with a handful of these. You won't be able to get a full screen like I've got going on here. You'll end up with a half screen, um, or the ball will actually do something like this. Uh, and that player is still sat over there. So you've got a half screen with the ball here, and next turn you've got to pop it in. Right, let's go and look at some inducements. Right, onto the final section of the video now. This is the inducement section. Before I do the inducements, uh, please do uh, be aware that I stream on Twitch every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evening from 7 p.m. UK time. And if you'd like to come and see me play Nurgle live, and you can ask interactive questions, then please come and say hello. I also stream on the weekend and they typically start from around about 5 p.m. UK time on both Saturday and Sunday. So there's five days a week that you can come and catch me live. It would typically have a couple of hundred people watching. So there is an awful lot going on in Twitch chat and it'd be awesome for you to come and, come and say hello uh, and ask some Blood Bowl related questions. Right, back to the inducement section. In here, ultimately, we're probably again looking very much like the uh, the bribe is the, is the star player of this uh, inducement section. Uh, I very much like that if you've leaned into uh, the dirty player sneaky git combo or the dirty player combo really is uh, as Nurgle have got access to uh, that's great but really bribes actually actually should be used for uh, one of either Biorot Vomit Flesh or his better but more expensive cousin Lord Borat the Despoiler both of which have dirty player plus two on both of those players so you've got the cheap version at 180k and if you can somehow find up to uh, 280k you can have a dirty player plus two who also happens to be strength 5 and he's annoyance in his own right, but you've also got a bribe to protect him. If you want to go up to uh, 360k, then you've actually then got this point, you've got a choice, you can play Lord Barrett Despoiler with Dirty Player 2 and a bribe, or you can step over and just take Morg and Thorg directly. Now the meta is starting to uh, try and deliberately stop people taking star players by hiring themselves, so actually taking Morg and Thorg uh, for your opponent, then handing all that money over to you, uh, that's fine. You just step over here and you don't take, you don't try and counter with Morg, your own Morg, and then nobody ends up with him. You then take Lord Bart the Despoiler with Dirty Player plus two and a bribe. And although they've got Morg, once you've knocked him over, you should be able to kill him. Uh, and then Morg goes away and you've still got one of the better star players. If, however, you're playing a game that's just must win, it's not bothered about damage output, then look no further than one of the best stars in the game. Uh, that's Hackflem Sc Scuttlebike. So you've got three of the best star players in the game access. Uh, an absolute menace and shouldn't be allowed on the Nurgle team. That's a gutter runner with movement nine, strength three. He's edge two plus, but he's also got two heads and prehensile tail um, and extra arms. So he's effectively pseudo uh, edge five uh, and he's an amazing player. Those are your star players. And really, if I can just stress enough, please take one of those star players whenever you're picking your inducements. That's where you start. That's where you finish. Um, you can always pick up to two. If you've got extra money, then you step back into the adjustment screen, hire a wizard or hire a bribe. But if you can get star players, Nurgle makes so much use of star players, it's unbelievable. So there's a point where I don't even think you want to be stepping into the mercenary screen and inducing anything. I think it's star players and bribes. That concludes the Nurgle guide. Thank you very much indeed for watching. If you haven't already, please smash the like uh, and also potentially subscribe buttons. Uh, I've done every single race guide almost now. So... Uh, any race you can think of, you have got it covered. Just check the guide section on, on YouTube and you'll be able to see them all. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.